whatever you pictures you find on you version are the work of Andy and that's what happens when you let him take pictures of you and mess around with them in his little Photoshop thing so there's probably going to be a 600% increase in everyone who uses you version tonight uh, because you all want to see those probably but I'm gonna go ahead and get into Romans chapter 8 um, I heard a story once um, of a park ranger in Yellowstone, and I don't know if it's true or not, um, but this, uh, this park ranger, he was going around and he was doing a, a, a tour, a guided tour. He was showing the, the, the wildlife and the... Do we need to switch mics? No? Okay. He was showing the wildlife and the flowers and the mountains and everything, and, and he's, he's just really good. He's really knowledgeable, and he, and he loves you know, doing these tours. And at a certain point, um, his, his two-way walkie-talkie, the, the, the frequencies go, or the messages going back and forth, didn't really pertain to him. And, and at a certain point, it just kind of became annoying, and so he, he turned it off. Um, and, and no sooner than five, ten minutes later, um, another park ranger came up, running up to him, breathless, and saying, hey, we've been trying to get a hold of you, you know, on your, on your radio, did you turn it off? And he's like, yeah. And, uh, and apparently, they, uh, somebody from afar had seen a grizzly bear um, stalking their group, and they were trying to get a hold of him. Um, but he had turned his radio off. And the reason I bring up that story is because sometimes I think when we get to, um, when we think about the Holy Spirit, and that's what a big part about, of Romans 8 is about, um, is we kind of tune the Holy Spirit out. Not because it's an annoyance, or not because it doesn't pertain to us, but more even because we don't exactly know um, what the Holy Spirit does in our lives and what um, the Holy Spirit's purpose uh, is in the life of the believer. And so throughout our passage tonight in Romans chapter 8, I hope that we will um, know a little bit more about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And instead of turning him or tuning him out, um, we can tune in to the Holy Spirit a little bit better. So we're going to go ahead and get into our text today. Um, the, first, the first section that we have is Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, whoever, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. All right, so the first aspect of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives that we're going to look at in this section is transformation. The Holy Spirit's work of transformation in the life of the believer. Um, Galatians is many times referred to as a mini Romans. It's a, like a, a tiny four chapter book of Romans. Um, and in Galatians, Paul says in one sentence what he exp expounds upon in about 13 sentences or verses here um, in Romans 8. And in Galatians, he says, But I walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5 16. So Paul tells the Galatians to walk by the Spirit and then they will no longer fulfill the desires of the flesh. And in this passage, Paul essentially expounds upon those words. And so the first thing that we see in verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, this uh, chapter 8 is kind of the, the end of a big section in Romans. A big section in Romans is chapter 6, 7, and 8, and mainly dealing with um, sanctification, the, the, uh, the the act of becoming more and more like the image of Christ throughout the time of our lives. Sanctification leading to glorification in heaven someday with Jesus. Um, and so at this point, when we see condemnation, we generally think that it's the opposite of justification. Um, but at this point in Paul's argument and his presentation of the gospel, we know that if we have the Holy Spirit, we've already been justified. And so a more accurate interpretation for this in verse 1, no condemnation, is that there would be no more need for penal servitude. 
So Paul is essentially saying that those who are in Christ Jesus should no longer feel the need to serve like penal servitude in order to gain righteousness because we've already gained righteousness from Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. And so condemnation can simply be taken as the opposite of justification, but in this case, it's just a little bit different. Moving on to verse 2, it says, For the law of the Spirit of life has, has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So the Holy Spirit sets us free from the law of sin. It doesn't mean that we are not tempted to sin or that we never succumb to sin. We've already kind of covered this. A little bit of this, these first four verses is, uh, is a, a summary of the previous two chapters. Um, in verse 3, it says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. Now, a key word here in this verse 3 is likeness of sinful flesh. Um, we know that Jesus was perfect, right? Jesus was perfect, he was sinless, and he fulfilled all righteousness in his time on earth. And that's why he was able to die as a sacrifice for us, giving us his righteousness as he took on our sin. Um, but sometimes the question is raised, well, how could Jesus be perfect if he's born into sinful flesh? Um, well, just, and this is kind of a side note, but um, the reason for this is, is found in it kind of, when you see the word son in the likeness of sinful flesh, um, it brings us back to Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. And in those verses, it makes it clear that um, it says iniquity uh, follows, follows from the father to the third and fourth generation. But iniquity does not follow and pass through the mother. And so that's the, and this is a short version, but that's the reason for the virgin birth. So if you guys are interested in that, go to Exodus chapter 34 and uh, start looking into that. If any of you guys have wondered why did he have to be born of a virgin, that's why. Um, Moving on into verse uh, 4. It says, In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Christ as a man fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law, and he accredits that perfect righteousness to us and through his death on the cross. Um, now, at this point, um, the next two sections, verses 5 through 8 and then uh, 9 through 13, show us um, more specifically the work of transformation that the Holy Spirit does in the life of the believer. And that's in two major ways. The first, in 5 through 8, is uh, a transformation of mind. And so we'll read that here. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, but it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And so the first work of the Holy Spirit that we see here is a transformation of the mind of the believer. A transformation of the mind from as we begin to set our minds on things above instead of on the flesh or on worldly desires. Like it says in uh, uh, Colossians uh, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, set your mind on heavenly things where Christ is seated above. This is part of the work of sanctification through the Holy Spirit in our lives, is that we begin to set our minds not on things of this world, but instead on the things that God wants us to do in our lives. Conversely, the, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God. People who are... People who are unsaved cannot uh, serve the flesh and cannot please God, as it says in verse 7. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And so another way of saying this would simply be to say that we begin to focus more upon the desires of God. Um, moving into verses 9 through 11. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin... The Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And so the second work of transformation um, in the, from the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is the future transformation of body. Future transformation of body. Um, we know that humanity is either controlled by sin and the flesh, which leads to death, or to the Holy Spirit, which not only brings transformation of mind but, and freedom from the flesh marred by sin, freedom from slavery to sin, but also brings, uh, leads to bodily resurrection and new life. In the next two verses, we see Paul's kind of summation of the first section and also a warning uh, to believers who continue to gratify uh, desires of the flesh, kind of echoing his words in chapter 6. So verse 12, 
So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so our new obligation as believers is to rid our lives of sin. And we've, kind of, we've already talked about that, right? Um, but going back to the first verse, there is therefore now no condemnation, no need for penal servitude. We, we no longer have to, to serve God in hopes of obtaining righteousness. We, we've already obtained righteousness. It, righteousness, by grace, is a gift, right? There's nothing that we can do to earn it. But at the same time, grace comes with a certain set of expectations. If you think about the Israelites, when, when Moses led them out, and, or when God, through Moses, led them out of Egypt, out of slavery, um, parted the Red Sea, got them into the desert, right, into freedom, and then what happened? He doesn't just give that to them for free. Then what did he do? He gave them the Ten Commandments, and then through Moses, he eventually gave them uh, his law, which Paul has established as good, righteous, perfect, an expression of God's nature. And so in the same way, today, after we've been given grace, after we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, our duty is to rid ourselves of sin because we are debtors not to the flesh, but to the Spirit. And so verse 13 is kind of an echo of Paul's words in chapter 6. And so kind of an application for this section, the, the, the transformation, uh, the Holy Spirit's work of transformation in the life of the believer, um, it's not instant. Um, as many of you guys know who maybe didn't grow up as Christians and maybe became Christians later in life or converted later in life, um, as you know, when you become a believer, the transformation is not instant, right? You don't have the, the, the mindset. You don't necessarily have the knowledge. You don't necessarily, don't necessarily have the habits that you should have as a believer to live a Christian life. And that's the and that's the process of sanctification that the Holy Spirit begins in you to understand how to walk um, by the Spirit, how to set your mind on things above, not on the flesh. And so practically, what, what does this look like? Because don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there is never a time to uh, seek wise counsel or, or go and talk to other people on, you know, what, what does this verse in the Bible mean or how does this apply to my life or, or how do I, you know, navigate this, this, this uh, situation in my life. Um, just because the Holy Spirit helps us to understand God's word, it doesn't mean that we don't also go and seek wise counsel from other people. So how does this kind of practically, practically work? Um, 1, Corinthians verses, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 16 says, These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities which, with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them, because they are discerned only through the Spirit." And so we see here that the Spirit helps us to discern God's Word. It helps us to discern what God wants us to do in life. And so here's an example. Have any of you guys ever been, been uh, reading the Bible, reading a passage of the Bible, maybe a chapter, or maybe like kind of studying through a chapter in the Bible, and all of a sudden something just clicked? Just like clicked all of a sudden, and, and, and maybe you've read through the passage a, a ton of times, but all of a sudden something just made sense. Or maybe you're, you're reading through a passage that you've read since you were a child, and all of a sudden you just feel really convicted. You feel really convicted by God's Word, something that you just read. This is the type of thing that the Holy Spirit can help us in our lives, can help us to understand Scripture, and to help us to understand how God wants us to live our lives. And so the Spirit isn't going to tell us anything new. He's not going to give us, the, the Holy Spirit inside of us isn't going to give us some new revelation from God, but he's simply going to help reveal what he's already revealed in his word so that we know how to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. The Spirit can help us to understand God's word to us. And so moving on into our second uh, section here, verses 14 through 17. None of you guys are laughing as you're seeing the, the pictures. I'm kind of surprised. Um, maybe nobody's on you version? Okay, all right. Verses 14 through 17 um, is the Holy Spirit's work of assurance in the life of the believer. 
It says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you who have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And so in this section here, we see that believers are God's children through adoption into the family of God. And it is the Holy Spirit inside of us that bears witness to the Father on our behalf. And so as believers, the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of us gives us assurance of two major things. First, the Spirit gives us assurance that we have been freed from slavery to sin. And not just freed from slavery, but have been adopted into a new family. Looking at verse 15, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. And the statement, Abba, Father, of sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Where, where else do we hear Abba, Father in Scripture? Where else do we hear that said? Jesus, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? In his, Jesus, in his darkest moment before he was crucified on the cross, cries out to the Father and says, Abba, Father. And so, my friends, this is amazing. In the same way, we as adopted sons and daughters of God, we can cry out to our Father, our Heavenly Father, in the same intimate way that Jesus did in his darkest hour before he was crucified on the cross. So this kind of brings us back to Romans chapter 6, where it talks about you know, being baptized and being united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. When we're united with Christ, and then it says that we will, if we've died a death like Christ, we will also uh, have a resurrection like Christ. And so in the same way, we are, when we are united with Christ, we are adopted as sons and daughters of God, and we are able to call God Father, Abba, Father, and cry out to him in the same way that Jesus did in his darkest moments on the cross. Now, the term of adoption might not strike the same emotional chord um, that it did for uh, those in early Rome, um, except for maybe if, if any of us have been adopted, adopted into a new family, a better family, or something like that. But um, it doesn't, tempor or doesn't uh, typically strike the same emotional chord um, with us as it would have to uh, the Roman audience uh, receiving this letter. Um, in Roman culture, an adopted son was deliberately chosen by the adopted father to carry on the family name, represent the father, and inherit the father's estate. And so in Roman times, an adopted son was in no way inferior to a son born by natural means. And so, and it, in fact, it, many, it, it happened many times, and in some cases, an adopted son could even obtain a higher status than those born of natural means, because the adopted father would search out someone to specifically um, represent his character and bear his image and bear the family name and inherit um, his property after the adopted father is gone. Um, and something that's it's just kind of interesting, it's important to realize, as we are adopted sons and daughters of God. In the same way, God has specifically chosen every single one of us to bear his name, to bear his image, and to inherit his glory with Christ. So the Holy Spirit's role in this is that he bears witness to the Father on our account that we are his adopted sons and daughters. The second assurance is that the Spirit gives us is the assurance of future glorification with Christ in heaven. As Christ was glorified in his resurrection and ascension, we too will share in that same glorification as sons and daughters of God. And my friends, part of this assurance is what gives normal or average men and women extraordinary courage. This assurance that we are adopted sons and daughters of God is what gives ordinary people extreme courage, like Martin Luther nailing up the 95 Thesis on the church. Uh, Elizabeth Elliot, whose husband went, went out and died in, in Africa trying to get the gospel to, to new places. And then she, she remained faithful to God. She wrote books and she spoke about it. And then she even went back to that same tribe and visited the same people that killed her husband in the name of the gospel. And so some of you, some of you may have had an experience or where you didn't know what to do or you're facing a really tough decision. But through much prayer, maybe you started to feel at ease with 
with the situation or you maybe started to, to feel that one specific um, like door was better than the other in a specific situation. Um, and this is part of uh, what the Holy Spirit's work in us is in assurance is that um, whatever we do in life, we can have assurance that, that whether we, we ex- uh, succeed or whether we fail miserably, whether we you know, get away with not nailing the 95 thesis on the church door and don't get killed for it, or whether we're taking the gospel somewhere and we do get killed for it, we have this assurance in Christ as adopted sons and daughters of God. And we have this assurance, and that's what enables us to do great things for God. Our third and final section is um, the Holy Spirit's work of endurance in the life of the believer. Romans 18 through 30. And I know this is a huge chunk of passage and we're kind of going quick and I'm sorry about that. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, and hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and attain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And so Paul is writing against an extreme backdrop of persecution here. Um, just previous to writing the book of Romans, he wrote the books of, uh, or the letters of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And so just a f- few short years later, but in 2nd C- Corinthians, he said, um, he wrote to them saying, this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And it's similar words to 17, which leads us into this next section, where he says, if we suffer with Christ, we will also be glorified with him. So Paul isn't saying that, that glory uh, or future glory is compensation for suffering, but simply that our suffering for Christ brings about future glory. And that in the same way Christ suffered and then resurrected and was glorified, we will also share in that. Um, so it's not that you have to suffer to be glorified, or the more you suffer, the more you're glorified, or something like that. Um, in verse 19, so it says, for the revealing of the sons of God. That's kind of a little bit confusing when you first read it. You're like, what does that mean? Um, really, this is just referring to the adoption of the sons and daughters of God coinciding with uh, the revelation of God's son. So when Jesus comes back and he makes everything new and he makes the world anew, uh, the adoption of us as sons and daughters of God, um, we will be revealed with that. And the Holy Spirit will bear witness on our account to the Father. Um, moving on into where it talks about uh, creation groaning. Verse 22, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So where it talks about creation groaning, um, when God finished creating the earth, what did he say? This is good. He said, this is good. And then he rested on the seventh day, right? Why was it good? Because it was perfect. Sin had not entered the world yet. It hadn't entered the lives of humanity and it hadn't entered the world itself either. And so ever since sin entered the world, what Paul is talking about is that creation is groaning under the weight of sin and death and suffering and persecution and pain. And it's waiting and it's groaning as it's waiting to be renewed when Jesus comes back. And so Paul uses explicit language here um, when he talks about this. In verse 18, he uses the word suffering. In verse 20, he uses the word vanity. In in verse 21, he uses the word bondage and decay. Verse 22, he uses the word pain. And then in verse 22, he talks about groaning together in the pains of childbirth. So he uses this image of a woman in labor. Labor is painful. I don't think any of us in the room have been through labor, but labor is painful, I hear. Um, it's, It's not something to be messed with. But it's worth it because what comes at the end? New life, right? An eager expectation of new life. And so that's what Paul, um, that's what Paul uh, illustrates this with, is, is a woman in labor and the pains of childbirth, but it's all worth it. The pain and the suffering is worth it because at the end there is a new life and there's an eager expectation of that new life. And in the same way, creation is waiting to be renewed. All throughout the Bible, that it talks about it talks about this in Joel chapter three eighteen. A spring will go out from the house of the Lord, um, 
Daniel 5.12 says that the saints will rest in Eden. Zacharias, Zechariah talks about there no longer being any need for a sun and moon because, um, because God will illuminate the earth. Zechariah 14 also talks about living water flowing out from Jerusalem. Jesus talks about a new creation. It's all throughout the Bible, and the earth is waiting to be renewed. And in this, the Holy Spirit enables us to endure in this pain while we wait for the earth to be renewed as our bodies will be renewed as well when Jesus returns. Verse 24, it says, in this hope we were now saved. Um, It kind of implies that salvation is already ours. And so the phrase, in this hope, indicates that our full enjoyment of it lies in the future. A full enjoyment of our hope lies in the future when Jesus returns. Um, Moving on into the, the next couple verses, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, the logic of these two verses can be a little bit hard to follow, but we do know two things from these two verses. As we struggle to pray, the Spirit intercedes for us. He prays according to God's will, and his mind is known by God. And so this is creating a perfect line of communication from us to the Father. And so, kind of relating to what we we looked at in the passage that we looked at in 1 Corinthians, where it says, no one knows uh, the, the innermost thoughts except for one's own spirit. And so in the same way, nobody knows God's innermost thoughts except for his spirit. And he has given us his spirit to dwell inside of us. And so when we do not know what to pray for, the Spirit, knowing the mind of God and knowing our current struggles or temptations or pain or whatever it is or persecution, can pray to God on our behalf. And so this kind of leads us to believe, with the backdrop of persecution, that during intense struggle or persecution or pain, as humans, we want that to go away, right? But we know as as believers that sometimes God uses pain in our lives to teach us or to mold us or to break us down to to teach us something. Or sometimes we we know as believers that persecution is something to be be considered, uh, considered lucky for, right? Paul says, I consider myself lucky to suffer for the sake of Christ. And so as a, but as a human, we still want that to go away. And so we have this conflict when we're in pain or when we're under persecution or we see suffering or sin as humans. We live by the Spirit, but we still live in a physical world marred by sin and pain and suffering. And so when we don't know what to pray for, because we don't know what God's will is, we know that we can pray to the, that we can pray to the Father and that the Spirit will speak to the Father on our behalf. And we can simply pray with confidence, your will be done, God. Your will be done in this situation. And we know that the Spirit will intercede for us on our behalf. Moving in, and which kind of moves into verse 28, it says, And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So Paul begins to kind of summarize this this last and kind of final section in Romans. Um, And in verse 28, we know that a believer can always be sure of two things amidst pain or suffering. God is at work to bring about two things, our good and his glory, right? We can trust in his perfect plan, and we can see that he is working in all things. Um, and Paul explains, Paul explains this process here, and is that um, for those who are called according to his purpose. And so for believers, we can, have, uh, we can have assurance, and we can endure through the Holy Spirit, because we know that God is working all things together for our good and for his glory. Now, our good and happy don't always, or don't always match up, right? Think about Joseph. Joseph was beaten and sold into slavery. That wasn't very happy for him for many years. But at the end, we know that God was, was was looking into that and working all things together for truly Joseph's good, his family's good, Egypt's good, everybody's good, and his glory. And Joseph was able to look back on that situation and say, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And so that's the kind of assurance that we can have through the Holy Spirit that produces endurance in our lives during times of persecution and pain and suffering. In verse 30, in verse 30 uh, Paul 
It says, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so, Paul, uh, in talking about a big section of sanctification, it's interesting that Paul moves from justification straight to glorification. And what's interesting about that is because in the middle is sanctification, right? When we are saved, we are justified legally before God. We are no longer guilty for our sins. But in between the time when, when we die and we are glorified in heaven with Christ, there's sanctification. But the reason Paul does this, the reason he skips this, is because the difference between sanctification and glory is only that of degree. Sanctification, the progressive conformity to the mind and image of Christ. Glory is the perfect conformity to the mind and image of Christ. And so to be put simply, sanctification is glory begun, and glorification is sanctification consummated. And we have the promise of this in Philippians 1.6. It says, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. And that is something that we can hold on to, and that can give us assurance and endurance through pain and suffering. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've spoken to us through your Holy Spirit. And God, we thank you that you continue to teach us through your Holy Spirit, God. We thank you for the transformation that you've, that you've done in our lives. And we are no longer slaves to sin. We thank you for the assurance that we have as adopted sons and daughters of you. And Lord, I pray that this would produce endurance in us as we face many trials, many temptations, much pain and suffering in the rest of our lives here, God. But I pray that we would never lose heart, never lose hope, and that we would push forward in serving you, focusing on things above. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.